Thank you, John and Arika, for that great introduction. And I want to thank the Ronin Institute for this generous opportunity. And uh, it's great to be able to talk with all of you. And thank you for taking your time to be here. I'm speaking on lands that are sacred to and were stolen from the coastal Chumash people. So here we are in Santa Barbara today, and uh, uh, we're in the middle of COVID city here, but we'll get through that. And I hope everyone out there is stays safe and, uh, and healthy. I wrote the Open Scientist Handbook draft because I've sat through numerous agency funding talks where the first slide announces the solution to the problems of science is half technical and half social, and the remainder of the slides outline an RFP for some new technology funding. I guess society is supposed to cure itself. I also never heard the word culture in any one of these talks. And then I read a dozen books on organizational culture and went to conferences where Silicon Valley CEO coaches explained that culture is at the center of organizational success. Ignore your culture, they say, and it will breed toxic behaviors that can destroy the morale of your employees and damage your ability to be creative. Let your culture fail, they warn, and it will kill your dreams. And right now, the academy is swimming in a swamp of failed institutional cultures, mostly because these have been ignored for a couple hundred years. The really good news is that there are several ways to rebuild a positive organizational culture for your organization. Some of these ways are outlined in the handbook, or you can go pick out others to use. The not so good news is that the, there's a great amount of effort um, to take during the period of change. This is real teamwork. And it needs top-down buy-in and it needs bottom-up enthusiasm if it's going to succeed. Also let me say here that I use the word science to mean any sort of academic inquiry from art history to particle physics. You are all included in this. I wrote the Open Scientist Handbook draft as a career anthropologist because culture change is the first step to any open science future and 90% or more of the community management folks I've been working alongside of came over to community management from hard science careers so they have very little background in the issues and concepts of societal or organizational culture. Here they can pick up enough content and references to add culture change agent to their resume. Nobody who's not already a cultural anthropologist wants to learn enough cultural anthropology to fully grasp the role of culture in society and history. Fortunately, you don't need to go there to intentionally improve the culture of your workplace. And scientists also don't have the time to become an organizational management expert just to start a conversation about culture change in their department or learned society. So the handbook gives you two legs up on the task of becoming a culture change agent. I wrote the Open Scientist Handbook draft because I've gone through 20 years of work as an anthropologist inside the governance of a remarkably successful open collaboration network called Earth Science Information Partners. There's a lot of success there to copy and share, and I encourage you to check out ESIP when you can. I've seen several attempts at using technological change, such as new software platforms, to code for open science culture change. And so I know the limitations of that. Software can certainly change culture. Software use molds its users to optimize how it's used. We are all culturally different because of the internet and social media. You see, culture changes all around us. There's no need to be timid about doing this with intention. One of the early tasks of any organizational culture change process is to create a vision statement, a destination where this new culture might take you. I ask myself, what is the option, optimal destination space for open science? Not some local maximum, but a global peak. And I really think it's a lot more than imagine a world without Elsevier. I mean, that would be nice, of course, but there's a whole lot more to the future of science than that. 
So I included several essays about optimal aspects of science, taken from the literature and explored here to provide some starting points for necessary conversations about the future promises of open science. Now on the operational side, science needs to quit the market economy and reboot its own commons-based economy. So there's some discussion about that too. But mainly I wrote the Open Scientist Handbook draft to share this as widely as possible so that others can hop on and start becoming open science culture change agents armed with a load of ideas and, and real tools. The handbook is on PubPub and it's an open document. If you want to help work on the next draft, just let me know. If you want to use it but you need to ask questions about being a change agent, there's a new HILO social network available for that. And I'll show you the link later so we can grow together as a society of open scientists. In this talk, I'll introduce a few topics co covered in the handbook. If there are other topics you want to discuss, bring them up in the Q&A. I'm try trying to limit my part to the first 40 minutes. Open access is a first baby step to open science. We can't do this and just quit. Free and open access to publications and the elimination of exclusive patents will unlock an entire chain of science method from ideas to hypotheses to experimental design to uh, methods, software, data, and all results, including null results. Going open will unleash an expansive range of research objects. How do we handle this abundance of science resources? How should we govern the organizations that step up to shepherd them? How do we get free from the tyranny of metrics and the games they become? We're going to need to bring in our research libraries as central places for open repository work and learning, to be partners in creating hundreds and potentially thousands of open collaboration networks and scholarly commons based on the needs of research teams and the growing capacities of information repositories. Open access for research findings it's just the starting moment. Open science is science unbroken. And what does that look like? Let's envision an academy where members openly share their most important ideas, processes, data, and findings through self-governing commons that are intent on the long-term stewardship of resources, on the value of reuse, on the absolute equality of participation, on the freedom of scientific knowledge, on open access to common infrastructures, and the right of all to participate in discovery, and of each to have their work acknowledged, if not with praise, but with kindness and full consideration. On its own, open access is just another way to encourage the marketplace to grab our intellectual goods for free and sell these back to us. We need open science in its own sharing economy. Now anthropologists tell us several things about sharing that most of us may find new and different from what we expected. These ideas about sharing synthesize from the study of human groups that have been successfully building their own lives for tens of thousands of years say to us that we have sharing almost completely wrong. Real sharing is not transactional at its core, but there is a kind of blanket reciprocity. You need skin in the game to get your share, and you do deserve a share when you operate inside a sharing culture, so let's build one. I call it demand sharing. Sure, you are expected to openly, generously share your research, but in return, you get to demand access to what others are sharing. It's like the refrigerator at your home when you were a kid. You could grab what you needed. Only this refrigerator is filled with ideas and solutions right now for the research issues you face today. It's like passing a new tax to fund local public transportation, only to find out that the local tracks 
now connect you to the entire globe. Thomas Whitlock, whose work on demand sharing is really important, calls out taxation as a key example of how demand sharing works across the globe today. Communities pool their funds to answer local needs. Demand sharing is when you devote your time to explain a complicated theory to a student during office hours. Demand sharing is what education is all about. It's how you finished your dissertation, how you learned enough to start taking lessons directly from nature and the infinite game. You already know how to do it, but the academy needs to refactor its organizational cultures for this to reach its potential. Demand sharing is real sharing. It's not charity. It's not a sideline in some other transaction. It's not Uber or Airbnb. It's what science at its best has always done. In a demand sharing economy, you get to steal like a scientist. You get to grab everything you need from the open resources available. But you also need to know that others will steal your work too. And if they do, you are happy. It means your work is worth stealing. And that's the whole point of publishing it in the open. Of course, you steal like a professional. You credit those you rob and you show gratitude whenever you can. When you find a really stealable resource, you tell everyone you know to come and get it too. Open up the academy and go out there and steal like a scientist. So science needs to quit the liberal marketplace, the neoliberal marketplace, and return to its own economy. It was there some decades ago, and when we reboot this together, we can add the internet into the mix. This means injecting significant culture change into lots of organizations. But it's not really a radical move. It's three steps back into a logic of practice science has known for a long time, and then a single leap ahead into new behaviors grounded in this logic and optimized for networking across the globe. <clears throat> It's kind of like being in a knowledge pandemic. And now we have Zoom. Fierce equality is the value floor for open science. Robert Merton called it universalism. It's the globalization that science needs today. Since science can happen anywhere, most of science already is happening elsewhere. Open science will bring geog the geographical long tail of science into the center of how science works. We need to get rid of the idea of science giants. Great ideas are giant, some events are giant, and a few conversations are enormous. But scientists themselves, from Auckland to Oakland to Portland and any other land, they're all just doing what they can to figure stuff out. All the rating systems and rankings and competitions for funding need to be explored for the perverse incentives they carry. They are the virus that has damaged science in the past 70 years or so, and science can get rid of them without losing anything. New logics of abundance will emerge based on the availability of mass amounts of anti-rivalrous goods, goods that gain in value the more they're shared. Every single science locale, funded by, their, funded by their local, regional, and national states, and other funders, will find that their value proposition increases the more they engage with a larger open global room of activity. The idea that a single place can be a center of excellence will become laughable, as real work will grow in value through global network effects. Clay Shirky talked about this in his book, Here Comes Everybody. There's an enormous science cognitive surplus across the planet. Open science will use demand sharing to optimize this potential. Now, fierce equality is, is not a luxury, not something to put off until later. It's the first thing to work on. It's the realization that the emergent capabilities for sharing, mixing, 
mining, and reusing science objects can only realize their potential as a planet-wide provident science resource when the entire community adheres to a real operational norm of equality. To build knowledge management organizations that are self-sustaining across decades and centuries of time and for the whole of the global academy, there is no more fundamental principle than fierce equality. One of the pushbacks you get when you talk about opening science is that academics are already fully invested in a range of powerful market incentives that now dictate the career success for them at their institutions. Their lives are effectively ruled by the finite games that for-profit publishers, somewhat antiquated agency funders, and fairly obsolescent learned societies now control. And this, we have to admit, is pretty much true. But none of these align well with the internal goods of science. How can you scratch if you don't itch? These market-based incentives also create conflicts of interest that limit the ability of the academy to accomplish truthfulness in the reporting of its results. This failure to uphold truthfulness complicates science's place in the public information ecology. We see this in the lack of trust the public has for science findings today. This is, of course, most evident today in the United States. Two responses are needed here. First, we need to create new incentives that funders, deans, and societies can use in place of current incentives. And this move displaces external incentives with acad academy internal incentives. Second, the next move is to valorize the intrinsic motivations for doing science, the emotional and intellectual rewards it produces without any other incentive necessary. Amplify and honor the itch, and scientists will scratch themselves silly. The idea that kindness might not be essential for the academy should be seen as bizarre. All learning happens through the kindness of shared knowing. One feature of kindness is that in, it enables both halves of the double meaning of the term care. To really care about someone or something, you need to tap into genuine kindness. To care for someone or something can merely be a job, but this job is also reduced without the impulse of kindness. The finite games that replace kindness or delay kindness well, yes, I fully intend to be kind as soon as I get tenure. Yeah, right. Well, these games damage the whole ecosystem of sharing. Generosity is related to kindness, and so is practical wisdom. Along with gratitude, generosity is also highly correlated with happiness. So you get that too at no extra charge. The point is that as long as we're refactoring the organizational culture of the academy, we might as well center this around kindness, generosity, and care. All of these are accelerants for sharing and learning. You work a lot harder than most people imagine, for a lot less money than most people would guess. You deserve a workplace that delivers what science offers, intellectual involvement, openings to awe and joy, conversations brimming with flow experiences, well, yes, and a lifetime of disappointment facing wicked problems nobody has ever solved. And then there's that damn reviewer number three. So a little kindness is in order. The notion of infinite play, or the infinite game, is so central to science that its lack as a mindset is significant. It's a simple concept. Science doesn't end. There is no last word to the book of science. Since this universe is a complex adaptive system, science probes this 
and experiments, fails and probes again. The increase in knowledge we gather tends to open up additional complexity to explore. The more we know, the more we know we don't know. And this is the infinite play of science. All that other stuff, the how science is really done, is there too. And all those finite games will take your time, your attention, and your energy away from doing infinite science play. There is nothing more serious than doing science. Science plays with the contents and dynamics of matter and life. Any doubts? Well, you can ask Hiroshima about that. Science also puts scientists in daily contact with the beauty of nature or the complex weirdness of culture and the feeling of awe that this can produce. Science also involves conversations that often become deep flow events, events so engaging that the best description of them is joy. Infinite play also governs how scientists view each other and their collective work. Infinite play welcomes more players, changes the rules, widens boundaries, and wants to improve the activity of play. It strives for more fun and better results, which are the same thing. Let's start with your next great idea. This idea needs friends to actually get great. An idea it's on its own in your head is like a seed in a seed packet. It needs ground to grow. It needs to join into conversations where the insights of others will nourish the best parts of it. The knowledge that powers discovery right now lives only in the conversations available across networks of scholars. Scientific articles rarely hold the scholarship they claim to convey. Rather, they are merely advertising of this scholarship. The solution is twofold. First, better ways of making science goods, all of them openly stealable by other scientists and not the marketplace, and more conversations across a wider range of internet-enabled media, including online direct conversations among peer-to-peer -peer networks. These networks create virtual rooms that are smarter than any of their inhabitants. Have you ever considered the gross asymmetry of an academic conference, where a thousand minds sit silent while a chosen speaker reads their thoughts? The room in this case is several orders of magnitude smarter than the speaker. In any case, this speech could have been up on the web with others and responses. The same room could hold hundreds of small conversations that push the information from this paper into a new level of shared knowing. If you want to measure knowledge in your discipline, don't count words in the literature. Count the conversations available across the planet. Now here's a formula stolen from the Clue Train manifesto folks. The level and quality of current knowing in any science discipline increases as the square of the number of scientists times the amount of available conversation. Knowing is knowledge as a shared verb. It happens only in conversation. But it is the wellspring of all knowledge in the academy. And it turns out that these same finite games that shut down opportunities for participation also silence most of the conversation. Science needs to power discovery. Open science looks to promote active conversations around the globe. It might be that this pandemic is a great starting place to put some technology into this effort. But real conversations need more community and culture and trust to happen. So technology is not enough. The handbook offers all the culture, community, and commons information you need. From a whole bunch of books you probably don't have time to read. It's a compendium of practical knowledge to help you become a culture change agent. You can't change culture without knowing some things first. Community is the container for culture. They work together. 
The commons governance patterns show how to govern resources together so that they're available, durable, and growable. A lot of organizational culture is toxic today, filled with the petty finite games of hierarchy, mismanagement, and run by assholes that gain their place of leadership because the culture celebrates assholishness. The handbook has a whole section on toxic culture and the, and the need to get rid of assholes. Culture is powerful. It can accelerate your success or murder your dreams. You want your institutional culture on your side, and you can build the culture that works for you and your team with a bit of effort, a measure of kindness, and a dose of time. You can use it to build a workplace that's a positive, even joyful place to do infinite science play. You create community as a container for your culture. You can welcome in anyone who, can, who will sincerely consider the values you all share. Belonging lets you jump into better conversations, lets you open up about your problems and be courageous about your ideas. You will have more fun every day and get more work done and go home tired and happy. Commons are the governance societies for the resources you are generating and using and want to grow and preserve. You need to work at this governance on a regular basis to be sure it's active and normative. And the handbook will give you a plateau of information to start refactoring the academy organizations that you now grumble about. It will also tell you how to deal with the assholes that plague your work life and let you know if you're the asshole. Sawagi Masho. Let's make a ruckus. It strikes me that the Ronin Institute is a perfect home for some cultural change activism. To begin with, we have all managed somehow to avoid the trap of getting tenure in a tier one university. And man, that was close. Huh, the stories we could tell. Okay, seriously, the Ronin Institute is a prime example of an open collaboration network widening the participation of scholars in the academy. The collective intelligence in this group is amazing. Think of all the conversations we can have, all the ideas we can shape into new ways of implementing open science. So wagi masho, let's make a ruckus. The handbook draft is a start. It's a gift you can steal and use. You can log into the PubHub community and let me know and I can help you. And create new parts for this and become a co-author and also help edit out the typos. If you wish, you can clone the text and create a new version of the handbook tailored for your own needs. But then you can share this with others in similar organizations. You can join the HILO social network there's a link in the chat. And scheme your plans to upend the perverse cultural habits of any academic organizations you work with. We can work with others to build playbooks, step-by-step -step instructions on how to do culture change in any organization, informed by our own efforts. There's also a, a, a program at the National Academies to develop these things, so we can hop on high-low and learn more about them. Mostly, you can start by being a little kinder today than yesterday, a bit less worried about hiding your ideas and data, and a lot bolder to call out behaviors and practices that are harming the science around you. It would be great to have some smallest grants to help pay students or postdocs to join this effort, so if you've got any ideas in that, let me know. And now many thanks for listening. I hope I haven't carried on too long. It's your turn to talk. Sawagi so, Masho.